Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Grayscale Gorilla Podcast. Today we got uh, we got the usual crew here. We got uh, Chris Schmidt. How you how you been going, man? How you been Hi, going? Everybody. I don't going think well. I've ever said how have you been going. <laughs> How how do you uh, how do you really answer that, Chris? Can you can you give that? How to have me? you been going? Yeah, how have you been going? Uh, I've been puttering around. <laughs> You've been driving mostly, walking. <laughs> Chad, how have you been going? Chad Ashley's here as well. I've been going sweatily. <laughs> <laughs> I feel That's like right. we're. I feel like this is a Mad Libs. Yeah, this uh, is a, yeah. Shot. Can you give me a a, a a noun, please, and a an adverb? That'd be great. Mad Libs are great. Um, and I'm uh, I'm Nick Campbell, and I I, uh, I appreciate you for listening. This is gonna be a weird episode. I could tell already. The the coffee, uh, lots of coffee today. It's sunny out. It's warm here, and um, we're we're back with another podcast. Uh, thank you guys for checking it out. If uh, if this is your first podcast, man, we have so many episodes now. Last week we talked about um, all the new Mac and Apple announcements. So if you missed that episode. We got a ton of comments and a ton of um, you know different opinions from that one. So we would love your feedback as well. If you haven't checked out that episode, go back and listen to that one and uh, drop us a comment there. But today, holy moly, guys, how like let's let's get right into it. I mean, um, we we've been busy back here working on some new updates. We got the busy, transform busy, busy. and the signal update. So uh, I know we've been talking about the BPM stuff with signal. We have some new type presets we're going to launch for uh, Transform really soon. So um, really excited to get that out and show you guys some new stuff we've been working on. But um, yeah, it's that's that's kind of that's kind of what's been going on at the beginning of the summer. How you guys been? Busy, puttering around, <laughs> puttering around. How you been? How you been going? I've been going uh, good. No, yeah, dude. This the weather's been fantastic, and um, I'm I'm a, we're so busy right now that it's kind of like I'm trying to remind myself to go outside and like enjoy some of the weather. So I've been uh, making myself get up every few hours and take the dog for a walk or something. That's a, that's a good piece of advice. I've been trying to schedule all my calls for actual phone calls instead of Skype because Skype is great and you get to see people and what we're doing here today with the, um, we use the hang Google hangouts to do this uh, show. It is very compelling to be able to look at somebody and have a little closer connection but man is it nice to walk around town <laughs> while you're on a phone call while it's nice out uh that's been a big part of my week yeah you forget that your phone actually is a phone like it can make calls and <laughs> it's like only that. one of those little apps in there yeah it's, it's just one app but uh and you know what you can also skype and do all that fun stuff through your phone too so uh you know you're, why you're, do we even call them phones anymore like i use it for so much other stuff before I use it for calling someone. Like I use maps more often than I use it as an actual phone. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's true. That but that's they had to do that, right? Like you can't come out with like a, a pocket computer. Uh you have to you have to you have to brand it in a way that let, lets people know what the heck this thing is. Yeah, that made sense ten years ago. It. Yeah. But what I is don't, it now? Yeah, but that's always gonna be, you know, we still like we still film things. <laughs> <laughs> like, hey, I'm gonna go yeah. film this. Like, people still come out with new records. You know, my new my new album just dropped. Yeah, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna tape that tonight. Yeah, so I'm, gonna I'm record, not gonna be home. I'm gonna tape uh, the new episode of um, Walking Dead because I can't watch it. Yeah, yeah I, I, those things just stick around. It's why it's why save icons are still little floppy disks. I mean, <laughs> there's the the language of this stuff just sticks around. We're human, you know. That's true, and and actually. We still have DVD discs on our website for all of our, or DVD boxes for all of our products. And I'm always curious, and maybe people out there can answer us in the comments, but is that still relevant? Like, I feel like, is that still, does that still make you, like, we don't ship DVD boxes anywhere yet. We never you, see you see them everywhere. Like, you see everywhere you buy software, a lot of people still use DVD boxes. And I, I want to know from people out there, is that still make you think like okay I'm i think we should this. make them look like vintage cassette tapes <laughs> <laughs> we could really make them look like anything we want at this point you know, like you know the old one like i saw this amazing willie nelson uh like uh album on or album see i did it amazing willie nelson cassette tape and it was that type of tape that i'm going to put it in the show notes if you guys want to go see it but it's a very specific thing because tapes were so new 
they didn't have rectangular art album covers, right? They were all square because they were originally on records. Mm. And so what they did was they put the top part of the record cover on the tape and then below it, they would put the artist title or the artist name. And then below that, they'd put like a track listing. So it's this really unique and really uh, not unique. It's really ununique. It's on so many tapes, but it's always the same font and it's always like the same style. I and remember I'm, those. You remember those? Like maybe yeah. that's what we should do. We should take all of redesign all of our products as vintage cassette tapes. <laughs> and uh, that'll be very clear for all of our customers out there. Oh, so yeah, yeah, there. totally. <laughs> Some audio archive site is what it's going to look like. <laughs> oh, man. Um, I love this podcast already. This is already uh, contending to be one of my favorites Ooh. of this entire year. Ooh. This is so we, we just cannot, we can't drop the ball now, guys. All right. Pressure's on. What are we talking about? You want to get through <laughs> the news first? Yeah. What's, uh, what's we already new? covered that. What's new in the news? It's, it, you know, things die down in the summer in general. Um, but uh, what, what, what has been happening? Well, I'm going to sneak a little bit in there. Um, so Signal is going to be launching pretty soon, but uh, we've been doing lots of beta testing and figuring things out, and everybody agreed about a couple of features they wanted to see us sneak in there. And so we, we went and did some overtime work and snuck in a couple extra features. So it's going to be an extra cool release when it finally comes out. Even more than what we teased uh, a, a, a about a month ago or a few yeah. weeks ago. That's There's cool. stuff that nobody outside the, the couple of us and some beta testers know about. Mm. Ooh, well, I'm really teaser. tempted to tell people now. Uh, Chad, any other news? Any industry news? Um, you know, if, if you guys haven't, I'll just I'll say this. If you guys haven't seen um, the NAB presentations, uh, Cineversity has, uh, has put all of them out. They are all officially out, and you can go find them on our website, including all of our presentations. Um, and, uh, of course, you can head over to Cineversity and thank them for recording all that stuff. That's so cool. Uh, hours and hours of, of uh, presentations from NAB are up and ready to rock. So I'm going to put that as a link in the show notes as well. And hey, if usually I wait till the end of the podcast to say this, but we always have show notes. If you're watching on YouTube, you could just click down below and uh, go right to any of these things we're talking about. And if you're listening on uh, your iPhone or your Android device or your um, Walkman, with one of those new cassettes we're selling, uh, <laughs> then head on over to our website and um, we'll have a link. We'll have all these links with the podcast. But yeah, any other news? Uh, well, I guess the, some big news, if you're into this sort of thing, and I know some of you are, um, Intel just like sort of is leaking out some of their new specs for their Platinum Xeon series, which are like ridiculous, like so many cores that, it's just bonkers. Um, one processor, I think, was getting like 7,200 Cinebench score. Um, uh, that's just one processor. And so that's pretty nuts. Um, so yeah, I, I have a feeling like if you're in the market to buy a, a new machine, you might just want to wait because there's a lot of interesting things happening with processors and GPUs and whatnot. And I think once uh, fall kind of comes in, we're, a lot of the dust is going to be settled by then, and we'll be able to really see what what a new system might might look like for a decent price. But yeah, the the, uh, the changes that are happening in processors, both uh, on the consumer and server level, are pretty insane. So uh, yeah, I'm watching, just keeping my eyes on it. Yeah, and if if you guys out there are looking at new hardware, um, you could always go to our is it our resources page? I always forget where we put. I think this. it might be about. I'm not sure. Yeah, I think it's a resource thing, but yeah, I know what you're saying. We have like all of our builds up there that you can go and our current builds, although mine now I feel like is antiquated and it's only like a year and a half old. Um, but yeah, go check it out. See yeah, we what, put, what we need we a rock. page. It's grayscagorilla.com slash resources and I'll put that in the notes as well. And uh, this is where we're always updating and we will we'll try to keep this always as up to date as we can. Um, up to date on the machines that we use uh, personally uh, and also other software and other hardware that we use, things like cameras, software, um, you know, apps, any of that stuff is all in one place. So if you guys want to see what we use day to day, head on over there as well. I got to update that with our, our new GSG camera that we got. I got to put that in there. 
Oh, I have a feeling uh, with today's topic, we'll, we'll be talking a little bit about some some cameras. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe we should uh, get right into it. What do you think? Any Let's other news? Let's do it. I'm going to be it. mostly listening in this episode, so. Oh, no, you won't. Oh, I think you'll have some opinions. That's good. Well, um, let me set this up. I um, was chatting in our uh, GSG Connect, uh, which I'll also add to the show notes. Um, so GSG Connect is where um, all of our, uh, well, a lot of our customers hang out. It's an internal Slack channel. If you've ever purchased anything from uh, Grayscale Gorilla, you can go uh, log in to your account, and in there you'll see a link to GSG Connect. And um, it's an awesome community so far. It's been really cool to talk and just kind of see how, uh, what everybody's working on and answer each other's questions. It's been really fun. But um, John, uh, John Bosley from over at the uh, Connect asked when I said, hey, what, what, what should we talk about today? And he brought this up. He goes, when should, when should you shoot practical and when should you do CG? Uh, you know, when you're doing 3D work or any kind of creative work, at what point do you decide, okay, I'm going to go make this in 3D? Or at what point do you say, I'm just going to go shoot this, whether it's a video scene or a, a photo? Um, how do you make that decision? And I, I certainly had some thoughts on it. And I know, Chad, you did too. And I have a feeling, Chris, as we open up the discussion that um, that you will as well. So that's kind of how it's framed. I think it's pretty simple framing. You know, all of us are learning 3D, all this stuff. And, and I think it's easy for any 3D artist to just kind of think that you have to you have to do everything inside of 3D. Um, so maybe we can have a little bit of a discussion of when to use practical elements and when to shoot it yourself and when to, or when to shoot it practically and when to start moving into 3D land. Chad, do you want to start? Because I feel like you probably have, you definitely have the most uh, 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 history with this at, at least. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I was, I did live action direction at DK for a number of years. So I would always opt to shoot whatever we could practically every chance I could get only because it's going to look better. It's going to look, it's going to look real. It's going to look beautiful, especially if you shoot it correctly. But my advice to people is always take a look at what you're doing and just understand that you may not know cameras and you may not know the live action world and that, but you can't let that get in the way of your of your decision on whether or not it would be something would be better shot than created in CG, because um, there's always people you can reach out to to help you out, and there are so many people out there that do live action production and are willing to help you out. If it's a paid gig, all the better. If it's not, if it's a passion project, there are tons of people out there looking to add that type of VFX type of work to their reel. So there's tons of live action people that are looking for partners and people to do cool stuff with but um usually for me it's it's uh it kind of comes down to a pretty simple like factor like how much time would it take to make it in cg would it be better in cg and can i even do it can i even do i even know how to do it to the level like have the skills yeah do like I have, have the skills? technical skills yeah totally so, like, if you can answer all those questions, and um, it'll probably give you an answer as to which 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 route you should go. If you're saying, "Well, I don't own a camera, and I, I don't own any camera gear," all that stuff can be rented, um, and that'll get us to a larger discussion in the podcast, which is everyone, every 3D artist should know how to use a camera. Every single one of you, if you're doing 3D at any capacity you need to understand how cameras work. Um, doesn't mean you have to own a really expensive camera. In fact, you could just borrow your friend's camera. Just learn how it works. Learn what an f-stop is. Learn how shutter speed works. Learn what ISO means. Um, learn all these things because it'll help you in the end. But back to the original question, yeah, I think um, uh, uh, when it comes to elements and you should always try to shoot them if you can, in my opinion, uh, unless it's unless there's a really good reason why they should be done in CG. If you need to iterate a bunch of different versions or the client's going to be making changes to the last minute, all these factors kind of weigh in. But um, I remember being at DK and, and we were working on working on a project that was all, it was a completely CG spot for, I feel like my camera just dipped. 
Um, it was a completely CG spot for a company that makes uh, generators for outside of your house. So like if your power goes out, this generator will kick in, okay? So the entire spot is kind of from a POV of a droplet of rain up in the sky. And the camera's following this droplet of rain as it traverses through the clouds and the lightning and it ultimately ends up landing on a generac and a little crown splash happens. But it's this epic move, camera move of it, like whoo, going down through the clouds and, and into a neighborhood. And there was no way you could shoot that. So we're like, okay, we'll just do a completely CG approach to this uh, because there's no way we're going to get, at that time, the drones weren't, great and you really didn't want to be flying around around in a thunderstorm so we did it all in CG and at the very end of the project we sat down and we looked at it and we're like you know what it's just kind of missing something it's missing just a little something and I think what it is is just that little realism that little little bit of you know organic quality that we just couldn't nail in CG so we went down into our basement we had like a little mini shooting space down there and we got a water uh, water mister, water bottle mister thing. And we threw some glass in front of a camera. It was just a Canon, um, I think it was a 5D or something, Mark II maybe. And we just threw some simple lights on it. And we just shot spritzed water at the uh, lens, you know, with a piece of glass in front of the camera. And then we put a fan on and we shot mist hitting the fan, hitting the lens. So we got this extra level of cool bits of, of moisture just kind of flying by camera and hitting the lens and blurring out and dripping down. And it just added it just added this whole other level of coolness to it that we just came up with at the end of the project because we needed to add something that you just couldn't add in CG without it taking a really long time. So think about using live action in ways that may not be like, oh, I'm, I'm going to do the entire thing in live action as one little part. Of, just like think about in your everyday CG uh, work, how just a little element that you could go shoot in two hours, you could get a lot of legs out of it. In fact, I think we used a lot of those same uh, water and mist elements while we were down there. I think we shot just some like straight up mist in the air, like little bokeh, like floaties. And we used that on, on several projects after that. So, yeah. Think about how you can do that sort of thing too. Yeah, I think yeah, there's definitely um, a what is it? It's a it's a compelling way to think that you can go just make it all from scratch and and add it to 3D, and that way it's all just done in the box, right? And uh, man, I'm sure glad I knew a lot of about photography when I started doing this. 3D stuff and it also helped my 2D stuff as well. I mean, every texture, every realistic thing that I could add in After Effects in post or in 3D really helped step my stuff up. So, uh, as always, you know, I'm I'm, I'm going to try to get some rules together for people to kind of to kind of think about as you start to think, should I be making this in 3D or not? Um, Chad, you already had a couple good ones. I want to try to capture. One is, can you physically do it in 3D? I think that's an obvious one. Are your technical skills up to make this look real in 3D? I think that's a good one to pass. Um, but what about other stuff? What about things that you might be able to do in 3D that um, that might um, e either look better or be faster? In that was always the question. You know, like producers would come up to me with uh a board and they would be like so we're you know what are you thinking we're going to shoot this and i'd be like actually no this one we would probably just do it all 3d and they would always i feel like producers never quite some of them were really quick and they got it right away but a lot of producers i think just don't have the background and the skills to be able to make that call as to whether or not it would be a hybrid approach or an all CG or all live action approach. And once you've been doing it for as long as I have, you can look at a board and be like, you know what, we'd save a lot of money if we just made that in 3D because that's that's gonna be a crazy shoot and there's no way we'll be able to get the camera to do what they are asking it to do. So let's just, let's shoot elements and then do the whole thing in 3D. So every job is different. I don't think there is like a magic list but approach it open-mindedly open-mindedly yeah sure 
Is that a word? Okay. <laughs> We're making stuff up today, so it doesn't really matter. Um, but yeah, just look at everything with an open mind and, and think about it in more of like a, a crafty gorilla way where you're not thinking about your project strictly through the lens of a 3D artist. Look at it through the lens of like, okay, I'm a filmmaker. I'm going to, I need to make this. I need to make some motion. Uh, what, what could I use as my tools? And sometimes all 3D is the answer. Sometimes partial 3D is the answer. Sometimes no 3D is the answer. Um, but yeah, you just got to, uh, you got to just like look at it and, and try to break it down in your head. Like a product shot, it used to be back in the day, you would shoot a commercial and towards the end of the shoot, they would they would block off like a half day or so to shoot the pack. It was the pack shot. And that was like an afterthought. Sometimes for some products, it was like a full on thing where you had a tabletop person and whatnot and they would, they would style the product up and whatnot. But mo most of the time, if it was like a beer commercial and it, you're just shooting a little pack shot at the end, it was an afterthought that would take a half day of shooting and sometimes longer depending on if there was stuff to be wrangled, like liquid to be wrangled or uh, a lot of you know intricate parts of the product that needed to be called out. And then CG started to get to a point where it was so realistic that people just started doing more pack shots in CG, which freed up a ton of production budget that used to be divvied out to these pack shots at the end of the production and now that money could just be done dealt with in in post so there there was you know there's certain things that just make a hell of a lot more sense to do in cg like pack shots you don't need to shoot those anymore the level of cg has gotten so good that almost every end tag every product shot every pack shot that you see on tv or even in uh, uh online they're gonna be 3d uh it's almost can inevitable. you describe that? Because I I've never heard that term actually. Pack shot. Oh, so at the end, uh, you might have heard the, f the term end tag. Mm -hmm. Well, an end tag is uh, is end tag could be anything. An end tag could just be a stinger of their of their logo or their catchphrase or some whatever. But a pack shot is is uh, a really nicely lit, usually um, shot of their product looking appealing. Uh, whether it's food or beer or an iPhone, those are pack shots. Every time you see the the iPhone flip out and like or anything, any 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 product that spins around and lands, that's a pack shot. The Coke bottle uh, with the sweat coming down it. Yep, that's that's a product shot, pack shot. Those terms are kind of used interchangeably. Gotcha. Um, but it. It used to be like you'd have to shoot that stuff, and that would take some significant time and money uh, because production is very it's production at a high level is really expensive, and so any chance you can get to not have that, not spend that money, or put that money into areas that are going to get uh, like uh, putting a lot of money into a, a live action pack shot back in the day, that's just what you had to do. But as like I said, as time moved on and things got better, it just became more of a natural. Um, thing to do it in post and do it in 3d so I, again getting back to the producers like they just you know some things they uh, some producers that are used to producing live action are used to solving every problem through live action production and they don't understand what's easy and what's hard in 3d either some will think that everything is easy in 3D and like, okay, why not just do everything in 3D? And then you'll have some producers that are like, everything is really hard in 3D, so we'll just do as much as we can in camera and as little as we can in 3D. And really, the the real answer is like somewhere in between there because they're, if you have a good crew and um, you know what you're doing with live action, you can do a lot practically. Like, there's a lot you could do. I mean, people have been making films a long time without the help of 3D. Um, so there is a ton you can do. Uh, but on the other hand, there's also like, where do you want to put your time and your money? Is If we had to do a commercial right now, um, let's say for Grace Gorilla, where, um, I don't know, our G-man was going to walk into an office like this and like, say hello to everybody 
of course we wouldn't build this entire room out in 3d we would just shoot some plates and then we would track it and have g-man walk in and do his thing um so yeah i mean some things are more obvious than others well, so let's talk about it from that angle because <clears throat> Um, there are, I'm sure there are people listening that working in a big studio have the ability to reach out and say, um, get a live crew together or be able to hire them. But I have a feeling um, a lot of our listeners are only going to be contacted when there's 3D and 2D to be done. In other words, if it's going to be more live, the, they won't even be getting the call, right? That Somebody else might be getting the call. So now they're doing their 3D part of the commercial or they're doing the pack shot at the end at what point does that artist want to also think about using practical stuff uh, and in this case maybe we're getting back to your your point about having a camera understanding how to shoot it shooting practical textures if you need it or the the liquid plate you know the the extra little lens flare on top of everything that's going to be practical uh, how can you think of some things um or some some ways for them to think about using practical stuff and not uh, always making it entirely in 3D. I think, yeah, I mean, there's so many times where if you have, and, and I sometimes, I guess I take this for granted, but I came up through live action. That's what I went to school for. I went to film school at Columbia College in Chicago and did live action before I did 3D. So to me, like I'm used to solving problems with cameras and practical stuff. So I learned 3D after the fact. So now I have this unique perspective where I can look at a problem and think, Okay, cool. Like I could, I could, I could spend the time to make a particle system um, for, you know, dust in the air and 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 make it look right and move correctly and render it out and comp it in, or I could just grab my camera and some uh, and a water mister and a piece of black fabric and go in my basement and shoot now pretty easily 4k plates with very little hardware um, so having the knowledge of when to bring those skills to the table I think is number one so definitely want to learn how cameras and and live action and production can improve your 3d but also help save time like there's cer certain things that you don't have to do you could just go shoot like a flare for instance if you if you don't want to use an I mean, they're great. The um, the flares that oh man, what are they called? The uh, the flares that Video Copilot has. Oh, optical, are, optical yeah. flares. Right. If you if you don't if you are maybe looking for something more ownable uh, than optical flares, then go get go rent a lens. Go rent an anamorphic lens from uh, online somewhere. And just get an LED light and sit in your basement for a night, and you're going to have a huge library of flares that nobody else has. So there's that quality too. There's like this really interesting uh, ownable quality to what you'll get from from having a camera and shooting your own elements, and uh, that I think is really interesting. In fact, a good friend of mine, uh, Amador Valenzuela who owns and operates a company called uh, Black Book Studios. Uh, he works on a ton of like movie titles. And he, he kind of comes from the same school as me where he, he knows cameras, he knows live action, but he also does 3D. So he's done the titles to movies like John Wick 2 and a bunch of others. And a lot of what he'll do is like stuff he shoots in his basement and then he augments it with 3D to give it this like really cinematic next level kind of like quality in my opinion that it you could technically do it all in CG but it would be really hard to get that organic natural quality that he gets um, and it's it's just really crafty and clever on how he mixes the two mediums together I think yeah I remember um, uh, Aaron Becker yep. uh, he was he was working at uh, our our last studio when Great Scale Gorilla had sh some shared um, office space. Uh, Aaron Becker was there working with us. What a what a great guy to be working next to. Super yeah, he's talented. amazing. Super amazing. Lucky on that. And um, he, I remember he had a whole 
four-day, three-day shoot with a giant fish tank. I mean, he, he, he like went out and bought one of the biggest fish tanks he could carry in. And they did all this practical, beautiful stuff with things falling in this fish tank and everything for movie titles. And man, this is a guy that um, thinks in that way as well, which is what he, uh, you know, he's looking for the best possible uh, output. What's on the screen and what does it look like and how realistic does it look and what's the emotion I'm trying to get across and everything else can be moved. If he needs 3D to do it, he gets 3D. If he needs 2D to do it, if he needs practical to do it, he really thinks of it as the outcome first, I think, and especially his his level of work. He's very, um, he's very much an artist in that way. How does the final piece look? And he will backwards engineer it and get the exact right piece in there to make it look right. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know. It's an interesting discussion in general of something that i've always i've i've always had a little bit of a part of because 3d was one of the last things i learned um i was i knew photography i knew after effects i knew about compositing i knew all these tricks i knew all you know how the plugins worked and when i finally got to 3d it was all i could do if if uh, i would much rather go make something in a photograph or in in after effects to plug into 3d world rather than build it from scratch because of my technical knowledge right like i didn't even have it so Early on, I was bringing in photos and bringing in even masks and animations from After Effects to try to, you know, affect them in different ways in 3D. But um, that is a diff definitely a different way of thinking. Chris, have you come across this kind of uh, stuff in, in your work or in, in anything that we've been working on? Uh, not so much. I mean, I came up like not in, like I, not the best direction where I was almost straight into CG. I still, I, you know. I haven't even purchased that camera yet. I guess I got it in my cart, but I didn't hit go yet on it. So like, I don't, I tend to think CG right away. And that's what I dive into. But you know, I also don't do a lot of production work along those lines. And when I've gotten to work on movie titles and whatnot, it's like, okay, well, we, we already have this plate and we're working from that. So my brain, and it's actually, it's definitely something I, I try and keep in mind a little bit, you know, on things like ask GSG when it's like, Oh, here's this question. And there's like these amazing paint strokes. There's like, it's like, okay, we could probably simulate those and do that, but I think just like taking a paintbrush and splattering it on some paper and using that as reference and out, getting an alpha out from that, like that's going to give us a reality to it that we, we're not going to get if we just try and do it in CG right away, or at least without not without a ton of time. I think a lot of the Ask GSG like, questions that I've seen that I, when I've hung out there, almost I'd say 60 or 70 percent of them contain some sort of live action element to them that people might not even be aware of well even just think I mean like and I use live action like, pretty loosely yeah but I mean a lot of stuff turns into everything's just another step in the process uh, when I was younger and starting to do CG I remember being like no I gotta do everything real like if I'm gonna make a desk I need to make the interiors of the drawer like I need to see the back of the computer <laughs> and at a certain point it's like oh wait no like that's silly if you're not gonna see it then why is it getting built and and I think the switch that flipped in my head is like wait this is all fake why am I trying to make it as real as possible when at the end of the day it's a 2D image that was, you know, just pixels that were rendered off of 3D geometry. Like it's all fake already. So, you know, along those lines, like, uh, you know, in the same way you're talking about shooting live action plates, like whenever you load an HDR into your scene, it, you're trying to bring a bit of reality and the imperfection and like a light that bounces off a wall, which bounces off a wall, which c catches a glint off of another corner. Like, oh, that is now automatically projected into your scene in the form of light and reflections. And that's why HDRs are so useful. Like they're bringing in this like extra detailed reality along those lines. So, so thinking of everything as just raw material and that it's all kind of fake in the end, like, like any raw material is incredibly useful and, and don't limit yourself I, to the more difficult task. I think anybody that approaches it from like a purist standpoint on either side of that spectrum is going to have crappy work. Or well, it's just unnecessary limitations. Like, okay, like it, like maybe both people could make it look just as beautiful, but a hybrid method could have saved you. You know, you could have gone and done it twice as fast. Right. Yeah. I well, mean, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say it would be crappy. I, what I would say is that you're. It won't be efficient, right? So, you're like, no, you're, I, I, like, I totally you know, think Godfrey, it, though, like that somebody that's like pushing and pushing for practical 
as hard as he can, right? And that's a unique artist, right? Like that's a unique look. And he's using some old school ways of, of doing this stuff and a, a, a little bit of digital trickery as well. But I wouldn't, yeah, I I wouldn't say it's a, a lot more digital trickery in his work than I think people even realize. But he yeah. does it in a, in a very naturalist way where it's not, it's not up front. But well, I, yeah. I, I think the distinction I'm trying to, to, to paint here is the difference between somebody that, let's say, is making a daily render and the goal of their daily render is to like, for example, learn Cinema 4D. And if the goal of your daily render is to learn Cinema 4D, then by all means, if you need a wood texture, see if you could do it in Cinema 4D. That's the goal of the project. That's the goal of what you're trying to do. You're trying to push the boundaries of what your limitations are. And every time you want to learn a tool, for example, if you can learn that task in the tool, then you're that much better at the tool. Does that make sense? Like, like I, I, I love this part of learning software. It's why I tell people to try to copy something exactly when they're learning software, because then the entire artistic process is already taken care of. Then they're literally just trying to technically recreate something and they start to learn how to texture things and how to change things and do all that stuff. So if the goal of what you're trying to do is to learn something, then by all means, use that tool explicitly. But if the goal of what you're trying to do is to like make your client happy with the least amount of effort and the least amount of time and make the most amount of money right in the process or save your client the most amount of money like then then these things really really come into play so it sounds like the three things i'm hearing over and over again and i guess this gets back to the basics is how much time do you have how much money do you have and how good do you want it to look um I guess those are the, the those are the rules for practically everything, um, but those three things will deter will determine um, w what tools you should be using. Yep. Yep. And yep. a tangent. I love I gotta, tangents. I gotta. I gotta. I gotta say, I really. Um, oh man, how do I say this? I want. I see a lot of really, okay, so no, that's not a good way to say it. This is really hard to, to put into words. I really, ur I wanna urge all the 3D artists out there to learn how cameras work, learn how focal length works, learn how lenses work, because um, it matters in 3D. Yeah. So have you ever looked at a 3D render uh, that had a lot of depth of field and you can't quite put your finger on it, but it looks small or miniature. Mm -hmm. That's because the human brain has been taught over, you, you know, it, your entire life you've been watching films, you've been watching movies with very specific physical restraints on focal lengths and lenses and cameras. So you're used to seeing things with tight depth of field in a very specific way because naturally the world you know where we're lives living in a physical world bound by physics so things with tight depth of field are usually shot with a macro lens or a long lens and it's very predictable how they look in the real world now when you relieve when you take those restrictions off in 3d and you have artists that don't understand lenses and they don't understand f-stop and they don't understand uh the physicalities of a camera you end up with depth of field on renders that make no sense and they're off, but they can't explain quite why. That's because lenses really matter in every single part of 3D that, you know, if you're rendering anything out through a camera in 3D, your lens matters. And I know you've talked about this before, Nick, so this is more of like a, a building on that, I guess, but part of that is depth of field matters. Don't take it lightly, don't overuse it. I think there's a lot of GPU renderer uh, solutions to depth of field now that have like made it actually accessible where it used to take a very long time to compute. So I'm seeing depth of field being used in really unnatural ways. And then sometimes that's okay. If it's like an abstract thing and you're doing some weird stuff, go for it. But I've seen it being used in ways that just look really off to me and are like not, it, it just, it's just an easy thing to, fix i guess is what i'm saying yeah well I, i'll i'll second that i i think one of the one of the things that i brought to my 3d career and learning 3d that really did help me a lot was my 
my uh, knowledge of cameras and knowledge of lenses and knowledge of, of composition and how to set something up in a frame so that it it is isolated from the background, for example, or in, in the right uh, hierarchy for your eyeball to like look at the thing you want people to look at. I mean, these are the these are the ultimate skills that you're being asked to um, use as an artist is is bring structure to the visual language and understanding the visual language in any way will help your career immensely. And I think this recommendation to learn photography and, and become a photographer or even just see the world through a square um, is a was was I'll just speak for myself a huge reason um, that my work started to look better in my eyes um, and, and luckily some clients eyes too um, was the fact that I could go learn how to take a good photo because the constraints on putting something in a rectangle that tells a compelling story and that gets the point across is is can be really tricky. I mean, filmmaking, like you said, the the whole language of filmmaking and editing and sight lines and the rule of thirds and crossing, you know, like not crossing the uh, the 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 axis of where people's eye lines are. Like all these things that you can go learn from film industry applies to a logo, almost all of it. And uh, the more the I found that the more that I applied my photography skills to my 3D skills, the the more realistic it started looking, um, and not not photorealistic. That wasn't really my style, but the more um, clear the language was, and the more beautiful it was as a piece of design. So, like a really simple one, and you brought up uh, a, a really big one was is focal length. Uh, in fact, it reminds me of a tutorial that I did dig really deep into um, some different types of lenses that you should use in 3D. I'm going to post that in our um, in our uh, show notes as well because you know what it's, it's not one of those tutorials people go reach out and and watch and find some cool new 3d trick because it's not a cool new 3d trick it's a really practical way to look at your lenses inside of cinema 4d and to be able to pick the right one so and even for those of you who are like hey i should watch that and then won't watch it let me tell you the big one for me <laughs> <laughs> if you are trying to make something look large use a wide angle lens and if you are trying to make something look small, use a zoom it, zoomed in lens. F cameras are fixed sizes, right? They don't make building sized cameras. And if all cameras are roughly about this size. So you have to remember um, that is also true about the cameras that, that, that are set up in 3D. Um, and if you break those rules of, of, of how big humans are and how big cameras are inside of 3D, you're going to mess up what you perceive at the at the outside. So always remember the camera inside of your 3D scene is not scalable. Think of it that way. That, that's a new way. I just I'm, I'm making up stuff as I go here, guys. <laughs> Think about the camera inside of your 3D scene as the only thing that you cannot scale. Everything else is movable. You could make it big. You can make a little house. You can make a big house. But the camera is just always the same size. So now you have to put the correct lens on this camera in order to see your objects. So to just think of it that way. Um, you could work that way too. You could actually set up everything to the right, correct units and you'll get a more natural kind of feel. Yeah, you know what? Uh, that That's also true. If you model with the right units and you get all that set up, that is also true. But all th this, <laughs> this also works because you, you can always move the camera back away. So uh, without getting into too much detail, we're getting into stuff that, I think is covered in this video that I think everybody should go watch. But the big one is, is if you want your logo, your person in the scene, your building to look big, the only way to capture large things in the real world is to put a wide angle lens on it or get way away from it. Those are the two things you could do. Move away from your object or put a wide angle lens on it. That's the only way you can take a photo of a building. Now, the opposite is true with small objects you can get very close to that object or you can put a zoom lens on it. And so just remember that you have those two options. And if you try to confuse those two things, it will look physically wrong to your eyeball. Your, your body will look at it and go, that shouldn't have motion blur. That's a wide angle shot. Wide angle shots tend to have less, um, uh, not motion blur, wide angle shots tend to have less, um, technically it's more depth of field for, for those of you keeping track. 
wide angle shots have less depth of field, which means more uh, uh, more depth of field, which means less bokeh, right? So if you have those bokeh, but is it, what do you think, bokeh or bokeh? It's a, I don't know. I've been hearing a lot of bokeh lately, and it's kind of growing on me. That is a fun way to say it, Chris. How do you say it? Bokeh. I guess bokeh would be closer. Bokeh. All right. I'll, I'll I'm open. I'm open to change. Let's try it. Um. Anyway, I uh, highly, highly uh, recommend that. So, man, photography. I'll, I'll take that even further and say, think about, okay, so, again, live action background. I worked with a lot of really talented uh, DOPs, directors of photography, cinematographers, whatever you want to call them. And they're like, a, a good DP is like a golfer. They have their bag of lenses and depending on what the shot needs, they'll dip in and grab the right lens. Uh, and, and you have to start thinking like that. You have to start thinking about your shots in 3D and say, okay, what am I after here? What would, if I was a DP, what lens would I put on the camera and give it a shot? Um, so for me, I'm always at like a 50 or a 55 when I'm in 3D, almost always. And, and the widest I will ever go is a 24, and that's only in rare circumstances. I'm usually around a 50 or a, between a 50 and 35. And if you if you just like spend some time reading uh, some articles from DPs and see what they like and how they work and what are their go-to lenses and what 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 kind of mood do specific focal lengths give, and just you know, experiment. Try try playing around with the lens and see see what it does for you. And if it's what's kind of cool and what kind of sucks about uh, a lot of three D programs, at least maybe I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong, but um, when I was using V Ray in three D S Max, you could use like this physical camera, where it literally had your 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 bouquet <laughs> was directly tied to your f stop, tied to your ISO. It was like a real camera in 3D, and that was really fun because then you could you could really get into it as mar as much as you wanted to. Uh, I mean, obviously, it's completely arbitrary because ISO means absolutely nothing in a 3D camera. It's literally just another exposure setting. Um, but it was fun to like kind of see. Uh, actually, you know what? I think what program am I thinking of that if you actually adjust the f-stop it might be Octane. Is it uh, Octane? I, I think V-Ray did it, and um, I know Physical also has a physical camera. Maybe that's maybe Physical is what I'm thinking. Yep. So Physical, uh, if you guys want to experiment, and this does help when you have real camera knowledge, it, it's a little hard to go the opposite way for reasons that Chad already said. Like, there is a little bit of trickery in 3D land that you could fake it. Um, but if you if you are familiar with some of these terms, um, focal length and, and f-stop, and want to start to replicate what you are using in your actual camera in cinema, you could go grab, um, look at the physical camera settings. And I think many other renders have these options somewhere. Um, I want to say V-Ray definitely did. I don't have a lot of experience with the other renders, but go find those numbers and dial them up and down and see what happens. Um, yeah, I mean, if you've ever sat in physical and like set up your shot and then you start to work on rendering and you're like, oh, you know, we really need a lot of depth of field in this and you end up, you know, bringing your f-stop down to like 0.05, that, that's not natural. Uh, that means that you probably are working at the wrong scale or you have the wrong lens or you're just not close enough to your subject. Mm -hmm. Like what, uh, there's all kinds of reasons. So. It's kind of a fun experiment to go into physical, uh, work like in a real physical units, and maybe if you have a camera at home, shoot something, you know, ch make the do all the settings. You know, if you're trying to do like a macro shot, like shoot something at home, and then try to recreate that same kind of look, mm -hmm. not identically, obviously, without you know all the work of modeling and H drives and whatnot, but do something really simple, and just try to get the same lens look and see if you can do it. It's kind of a fun experiment. Yep. Uh, I did find this tutorial. It's less than 15 minutes, folks. I'll promise you that. 15 minutes. Uh, I, I, I'll, we'll put it in the show notes. I, I actually made some notes here, too, that might be helpful for those of you listening. I wrote down, wide-angle lenses, 15 millimeters to 35 millimeters, makes things look large, impressive, powerful, looming, and overwhelming. And telephoto lenses, 
which I wrote as 85 to 300. And then you have everything in between there that's kind of a normal lens. Uh, and that's, Chad, what you're saying you use most of the time. So do I. I use 50 to 80, you know, uh, over half my renders. But telephoto lenses, when you really zoom in, make things look small, fun, cute, far away, sometimes weak. So think of it this way. A lot of times with zoom lenses, you're aiming down. You're, you're trying to take a photo, especially macro photography. You're, you're aiming down at like a bumblebee or whatever. You're also, those things look smaller because we're looking down on them. Um, so there's a lot of, God, there's so much of language of film that is built into our brains because we watch movies and we watch TV shows and we know what all these things mean. And the more that of that that you can apply, um, man, I, I, it's uh it's it's been it's been very helpful to me for sure think like a filmmaker mm. 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 aim so you know what that's it you said it right there what we're doing what you're doing and oftentimes what what people are asking you to do is not necessarily be a 3d person and not necessarily you know whatever whatever you put on your business card is not necessarily what they're hiring you for you are you're most of you are hired out there to tell a story or to get a message across to the consumer, especially in advertising. How clear can you make it what your widget does that you're selling? How clear can you put across the emotional? And so let's just start with emotion. How clear can you put the emotion into the viewer that they're wanting to put into them? Is it the need to want something new? Is it feeling romantic about something? Is it feeling nostalgic? Is it, um, you know, what, what is the emotion you're trying to put into the viewer? And then also part of that is how do you get the message across clearly as far as um, a, a visual language? So just things like typography. This is why typography is so big. This, this is reaching a little bit further than what we could talk about today, but typography is big because that is literal messaging, like words that you want them to read and understand the way that they're current together and the typeface that you choose and how long it's on the screen and what color it is and how it animates on all tells a different story to to uh, tell the brand to, to tell the consumer what that brand is if the letters come on really you know stiff and robotic that might be a more like um aggressive brand than if all the letters bounced in like it's on Nickelodeon, right? So all these things matter. Um, and you know what? I think I think we should talk more about this stuff. I think, Chad, you know, that's something I've always uh, loved about your work. And you bring a lot of that to, um, you bring a lot of that to your work. And it's making me realize, um, or maybe this is a good question. If you guys are listening, you want to hear more about this stuff, what do you call that? It's the filmmaking, right? It's the filmmaking side of this. Um, you want to hear more yeah. about that stuff? Let us know in the comments because I think, um, you, Chad, I would even love to have another, uh, you know, couple hours to just corner you on some of the things that you think about uh, what colors you choose and what cameras you choose, and what typefaces you choose and what all that stuff means. There's a lot there that I've, uh, I've learned from you, um, not only in the past, but just as you've been working here at the company. So, um, yeah, that, let's talk, I'm, man. I'm putting that on my to-do list. Everybody's got the, everybody knows the language too. That's what's, that's, what's great. Like, don't think that you don't know the language. If you've grown up watching films and watching TV and, and reading books and just any, any sort of like storytelling medium, you've, you've already been steeped in the knowledge. You already know it. You just have to apply it in ways that, maybe isn't completely obvious to you right now. And if you just start to tweak the way that you think about these sorts of things, you're going to find your work is going to be more compelling. It's going to be more, uh, it's going to achieve your goals a lot faster. Uh, a lot of my work is not super complicated. It's actually really, really simple. And it's just through knowing how to speak the language of film and la the language of design that you can really just do a lot more with a lot less. That's anyway. a good way to that's a good way to put it. Um well dang, this just sparked about four different other tutorials, I think, or or like discussions maybe that we should um 
that we should have. Uh, but if you, again, if you guys are listening, have any thoughts about this, drop them in the comments. We're always reading and uh, getting ideas for stuff as well. You know, Chris, I've always, I, I've always liked how um, how you want to build things how you always approach things from the technical side of it like that. Um, but, but listening to all this stuff, you know, how do you, is, is there something that you could think of that you're like, Oh, I want to go explore that more. The thing that's always forced me to be, I guess, more creative in my thinking on those things has always been like crazy deadlines. Like, you know, back when I used to do some, pro some production, it'd be like, here's this thing, we need it in this time. It's like, all right, there isn't time to do those things. It's like, okay, like, wait, let's go like back to a desk again. It's like, okay, there's going to be desk drawers. Let's not worry about the interior. So it's just a flat face and they'll stick a cube on the front. It's like, okay, do we have time to put a handle on there? Okay, no. Okay, we'll just put a sphere. Okay, a sphere, that is now the handle. It's got that little bit. It's like, you know what? Maybe that's even just an image. Maybe there's just a little circle in the center there. And now that's doing that. Like that took... You know, it's it's translating as a desk. We're not going to get that close to it. It works. So it's all about, you know, like when it's like, oh, big time crunch. Meanwhile, if there's a lot of time, I'd be like, no, I want to make the desk all super perfect and it's going to be ideal and everything's going to be parametric so I can change anything in the future if need be. I never want to make anything. I never want to bake it down because what if I need to make a bigger, you know, a, a bigger handle needs to be put on the desk drawer. And do you know how often I would actually go back and like re-edit that? Like never. You never go back to the other file. Like it's good to have the one to go back to, but you know, to make changes if need be, but like keeping a parametric in every scene just because what if something needs to change a little bit? It's like, no, you just copy it back in again. Like, what's yeah. that saying? Isn't there a saying like, um, I want to keep saying that it's the ingenuity, uh, is the father of invention, but I feel like there's another one about uh, like, um, what's necessity the one? is the mother of all invention is the one. And so this is necessity of time. Oh no. Yeah. It's if, um, yeah, so th I totally agree. Like, nothing will make you more resourceful than a crazy deadline. It's or... like optimizing. Like, you are optimizing everything and yep. optimizing for this current time constraint. And then suddenly you're like, oh, this can be thrown out the door, and this can be thrown out the door. That reminds me of a, um, a job I did a long time ago, and I'll, I'll make this quick because I know we're running a little long. Um, so we were doing a Sears commercial and the client wanted, and we were had about 10 different refrigerators, 10 different washers and dryers, uh, just tons of these appliances, these giant appliances. And the client wanted this crazy end tag where they wanted to see a sea of these, of all these appliances, like in, uh, on a white psych, like matrix style. I think, you know, it was kind of like that moment where the, all the guns came out, but these were going to be like appliances on a white psych. And at the time we didn't have time to do them all in 3d and we didn't have, we could, there's no way we could get the CAD data. There's no way we could just build them all. I mean, we had very little time and the, a shoot was planned and they already, they had a shoot planned for the main live action part of the spot. And they were already going to have a lot of these devices on on set. So I had this idea of saying, okay, what if we set up like a little second stage off to the side and me and my buddy, Jeremy Stewart are going to shoot every, once you're done with an appliance, bring it over to our little second stage and I'm going to shoot the front and the sides and the top uh, separately as stills. And I'm going to try to bring them back into the studio. Hadn't, hadn't really even tested this out yet. But the idea was that I was going to take the photos of each one and model a very kind of simple generic version of the appliance and then just project the pictures back onto the geo. And at the time, nobody had, this was like before projection mapping was really a big thing. It was just kind of an idea because I had saw it in the making of of a film and I'm like, oh, maybe that'll work. So we got the client to believe that this could work with a simple <laughs> test and it didn't wasn't a great test, but it was enough to make them think, all right, let's try it. But yeah, we, we didn't have time to build all this stuff. So we literally shot all these photos. 
of every single appliance. And we brought them back to the studio and mapped them onto simple geometry. And then we uh, created a shader on top of everything to kind of, because a lot of these are metallic or they're glossy in some way. You needed some sort of reflection rolling over the top of them. So we tried to paint out any reflections that were in the maps that we shot. And then we added them back in with another shader on top of it, catching like, you know, cards and stuff that we made in 3D. And it worked flawlessly for the time it wasn't hd or anything it was a little bit before hd um so we had a lot of a lot of leeway we could cheat a lot back then a lot back then let me tell you um, <laughs> more motion blur yeah exactly there was a ton of motion blur let me tell you <laughs> there was mo an unnatural amount of motion blur uh but it worked and it was just like the scrappy idea of like okay uh we don't want to say no uh, but we we can't really say yes, yeah, so let's find a way to make it work that maybe is a little unconventional. And it really takes, um, it, it took me doing a test and then convincing people at the place that I worked that, it, that, that we could present this to the client as an actual option and I wasn't just some crazy kid. Um, so you got to be willing to stand behind these crazy ideas that'll save time and and uh, and think outside the box. I think is really the main point I'm trying to get at. Is when when you're confronted with the crazy deadline, don't just immediately dismiss it. Just try to think of like a weird, scrappy way of, of fixing it. Like for your desk thing, um, like it, the reason that I thought of it, it was like if somebody came to me and said, "We need to make this desk, and we don't have time." I would be like, cool, um, can I just go shoot that desk right now and like shoot all the drawers from the front and like just texture map that onto a plane and like now I've got a pretty awesome looking desk. Like that's how I would, my brain goes to that kind of problem solving or like, you know, can we, um, uh, you know, can we, can we shoot the, the, the top of the, of the desk I have right now and this becomes the texture for the top. Like that's kind of how my brain goes to solve those types of problems. Yeah, and um, you know, maybe to wrap up, I think uh, I'm I'm definitely guilty of this. Whatever new thing I'm learning, I want to um, translate any anything I want to try through that lens. Um, if I'm learning Cinema 4D and there's something cool I want to I want to rebuild, I look at it through the lens of Cinema 4D, and I think that um, can be again useful if you're learning something new, but at the end, when you're really getting paid to do this stuff, for those of you freelancing and looking to freelance and who, and those of you already doing this uh, probably know a lot of this, when you're getting paid to do this, what matters is the pixels that end up on the screen. What matters is the final render. That is the ultimate thing that matters. No other tool, no other process, no other did you use this brand of camera or this brand of camera or did you use this 3D renderer or this 3D renderer. None of that matters. It only matters what is on the final screen. So if you can bring in live action, if you could bring in textures, if you could bring in any anything from in, another piece of software that you might not think... Um, is is technically professional you know like if something works if it works on the final pixel that's really all that matters now internally as an artist you want to grow you want to push your skills you want to try new things i think that's always um a, a huge part of being a creative person but um you know professional uh commercial work takes a lot more than just the tool that you have in front of you so it's um this is this is potentially a much bigger topic. I would love I would love to hear you guys' thoughts about it. Um, if you have done a really fun, tricky thing with practical stuff, a, a bunch of projects are actually coming to mind right now. Um, especially at Digital Kitchen, we we never had, well, rarely had a, a a ton of time on those projects, so we had to run and gun a lot of fun stuff. Um, but that ultimately was some of the most fun stuff was setting up a a, a crappy green screen and <laughs> getting the shot we needed. Um, so yeah, if you guys have any stories about this stuff, we'd love to hear from you. Any other tricks or thoughts about this? And uh, man, I'm I'm with you, Chad. If you and and Chris too, it sounds like uh, you're you're almost buying your first camera, your first SLR camera. Um, go do it, do go it. Learn that stuff. That stuff has been hugely helpful for me and uh, many other artists um, to just translate into that. 
it's all a visual medium. I think that's a good way to wrap it up. Anything visual you could bring to the table, you're going to be much better off. Um, not just another piece of software to learn, not just another, you know, uh, technique to try. Bring some of that old school filmmaking. <laughs> what would you say, Chad? I think you had the title. Everyone's a filmmaker. Oh man, now I forgot it, dude. Everyone, I think it was like every, everyone's a filmmaker. Here, I'll say it. So now that could be the title. Um, well, that's a probably good place to wrap it up, guys. Any, unless there's anything else, and uh, if not, uh, don't forget about the show notes. We're gonna have a lot on this one. We mentioned a lot of uh, uh, artists' names and some software and that tutorial about the camera. Don't forget to check that out. And um, as always. Are we all set, guys? I didn't want to interrupt if there's any last thoughts. You're all good? No, we're good. Thumbs up. Let's wrap it up. It's a nice day. I'm going to go for a walk. Folks, thank you for listening. Um, this, uh, this podcast has always been fun. And you know what? We always need uh, new topics to talk about as well. So if you guys have a specific question or running into something in your career, don't forget to drop it in the comments. We'd love to hear from you guys on YouTube or over on iTunes as well, or in Google Play, which we're now in. So uh, with that, thank you very much for uh, listening to another Grayscale Gorilla podcast, and we will see you in another episode really soon. Bye, everybody. Bye.